Thank you so much for that warm introduction, Ophir. I am so excited to be in conversation with Ken to unpack the dichotomy of how Israel is portrayed on the world stage. On one hand, we see the vilification of Israel by NGOs like Amnesty International and international bodies like the UN Human Rights Council, who routinely attack Israel through one-sided resolutions and biased reports. On the other hand, we see nations, specifically Arab states, normalizing relations in historic ways through the Abraham Accords and welcoming Jews and Jewish life in unprecedented ways. So with that, Kenny, I'm gonna to turn to you for our first question. Can you briefly explain this contrast that I just mentioned? How is Israel being treated by NGOs and international bodies like Amnesty and UNHCR? And then how does that compare to what's really actually happening in the real world diplomatically, including with uh, Arab Muslim countries across the Middle East? I think it's a stark contrast uh, in two ways. First of all, on the ground, as you said, it, it's just amazing that Arab countries that never would have anything to do with Israel, not only recognizing, but dealing on many levels with Israel. And at the very time we see organizations who've had a bias against Israel, but now are going beyond that to criminalize the very existence of the Jewish state as we saw in the Amnesty International report. I don't believe this is an accident, by the way. I call them spoilers. They get, the anti-Israel forces get very upset and nervous and almost panicky when they see Arab countries recognizing Israel because it undermines the notion that Israel doesn't belong in the Middle East. And, I, so, and secondly, I think it's a stark contrast because there's a vision of the future. The normalization offers hope for the people of the region. This kind of continuing assault and bias offers more conflict and more destruction. Totally agree with you. So a lot of what was behind this change on the diplomatic front with the Arab world had to do with the Abraham Accords. So I want to hear from you, what does, in your view, the Abraham Accords mean for Israel's long-term interest in the Middle East? And what are the chances for peace with the countries like Saudi Arabia, who have not yet normalized? Well, the Abraham Accords are transformative, uh, as uh, Tal Becker, leading Israeli official, has referred to it. It, it. it includes language which speaks about the historic Jewish belonging to the Middle East, along with Arabs, which really counters all the delegitimization efforts. And it offers the integration of Israel into the region. And we've always said Israel has so much to contribute to other nations, technologically, economically, and hopefully ultimately de democratically. And so it just offers a tremendous transformation, not only for Israel, but potentially for the region. Now, when it comes to Saudi Arabia, I'm always kind of questioning what they're going to do because insecurity is the key word to Saudi. They're always worrying about the regime and about. So I'm not, I'm not one who's rushing to believe that the Saudis will join the other Arab countries. Having said that, there are two factors that still might lead to that change. One is the fact that trends are overwhelming and that they can't ignore that. And secondly, the Iranians. The Iranian threat is growing rather than diminishing and they more and more may see that uh, joining in with these countries strategically as well as culturally and economically will be to the benefit. But again, I'm always skeptical with the Saudis because of their own internal insecurity. Completely agree with you there. Um, the Abraham Accords were really uh, transformative, but what has been uh, not touched by it is um, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So what do you think the impact of the Abraham Accords have been on the two-state solution um, for the Israelis and Palestinians? And really, what impact could reports like Amnesty and UN Human Rights Commission, Commission of Inquiry have on both the Abraham Accords and the Palestinian-Israeli conflict? The truth is the Abraham Accord should be a, a, a benefit to Palestinians. They should see how things can change and that they could get a lot out of, out of uh, changing their rejectionist positions over the years. But of course, we've had too many examples of missed opportunities, so I wouldn't rush to that conclusion. But I think it, it could be a model for, for things going forward if only leadership would be able to assert. Now, on the Israeli side, it's good that progress with the Arab states is not being held hostage to the Palestinian issue, but that should not be a reason 
for Israel to avoid addressing the Palestinian problem simply because it's in Israel's interest to do so. Israel needs to remain both a Jewish and democratic state. And a key to that is finding at least some progress on the Palestinian issue, if not an ultimate solution. So it seems to me that it's in Israel's issue not to say, oh, we don't have to pay attention to the Palestinians. Oh, that's not realistic. It will lead to violence and all kinds. Of, and I think ultimately it's in everyone's interest to, to think as of the Abraham Accords as a model for, for other things that can move forward. So I, I think it could be beneficial to all, but it requires leadership. Maybe, Kenny, finally, um, we at ADL have both promoted the Abraham Accords, um, heralded them, welcomed them, and also strongly pushed back against the reports like the Amnesty Report or the Commission of Inquiry. Can you talk a little bit more about what ADL is doing and how we're leading with that on both sides? Yeah, we've been, yeah, we've been very involved uh, in terms of publicly promoting the Accords, writing about it, speaking about it, and really having contact with uh, officials uh, on the UAE side and other side. We had uh, a virtual uh, session with our lay leaders, with uh, ambassadors from the UAE, Bahrain, Morocco, in which we encouraged them to, to keep on moving forward with Israel. And we work with uh, members of Congress and others to advocate not only for support for the existing accords, but efforts to try to uh, expand those accords. So we've, we've been very active and we, we see ourselves as really perfect partners with these uh, Arab countries who are interested in, in also making changes in their own societies. And I think ADL is a perfect partner. So we're looking forward to even more activity uh, uh, with them. Uh, as, to, um, as to the role of, of Amnesty it, 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 and others, Again, Israel is hurt by this, but the truth is the ones who are hurt the most are, the, are those who think they're serving the interests of the Palestinians by playing into the rejectionist card and playing into the illusion that, well, we still have all these groups that are attacking Israel, therefore Israel somehow will disappear. Instead of trying to bring them into a pragmatic approach, which can serve the interests of the Palestinians as well as the interests of other parties. So what we're looking for, again, the Abraham Accord serves as a model, is to say this is, should be the future of the Middle East, not all the usual anti-Israel bias, which again hurts Israel, but the truth is it's hurt the Palestinians far, far more. With that, Ken, I want to thank you as always for your excellent insights into these issues, and thanks again.